Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, again, for those of you who were here early. Um, good afternoon. Could everybody just find their comfy seats? And we'll get started. So I am very excited to get our program going. But before I do, allow me to recognize... Senator Shireen Golden Campbell. Senator, thank you for coming. And to all the partners of the Pan Jamaica Group who have worked tirelessly to get this going, the directors, um, our own directors at the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, and, and of course Pan Jamaica and the other partners as well. A big welcome and a welcome to the entire audience, both here and online. I am Michael McMorris convener for the Downtown Redevelopment Working Group at the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce. As the name suggests, we are focused on bringing stakeholders together to unlock the tremendous unrealized potential of our city center as a business, residential, leisure, and culture hub. In that regard, I am extremely proud to be the master of ceremonies for this evening and to welcome you on behalf of all the partners to the third staging of the Maurice Facey Lecture Series where we will discuss the value of a vision, the transformative power of an actionable plan. We would like this event to be as interactive as possible. And as a result of that, our friends from CAPRI, Caribbean Policy Research Institute, have enabled us to use an online audience interaction tool for the submission of questions, which I will then pose to our keynote speaker, Eleanor Sharp, later in the program. Um, we went through this in person here, but for those online, we're going to run through it one more time. And um, you obviously have to have access to the internet. And you enter the, you enter, once you have um, internet access, here, of course, it would be Hilton Honors Meeting, and you can look at it at the, the left of the screen. Hilton Honors Meeting is the URL and you enter the password, all caps, KINOC, K-I-N-O-C, and common letters, P-R-E-M-I-U-M, premium, KINOC premium. But for those of, for, once you have Wi-Fi, wherever you are, you can then go to your web browser, type sli.do, sli period do, and then for your event code, it's MF Lecture 2023. MF Lecture 2023. And you click the blue arrow and you're now able to ask all the questions to your great delight. And that will come as you hear our wonderful lecture. Um, we'll have about 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. So I encourage everybody to ask questions as you, as you think of them. And we'll do our best to get to them. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome person who is the, uh, the, the architect, there you go, how about that for a pun, the architect for um, the Maurice Facey Lecture through the CB Facey Foundation, um, here to shake things up, too soon, too soon, okay, so <laughs> here to bring his opening remarks is Pan Jamaica Groups, you're just getting it, <laughs> work with me, work with me, work with me. Coffee for everybody. Coffee for everybody. Not getting it? You need this? Oh, apologies. Um, right. So anyway, without further ado, Stephen Facey, Pan Jamaica, Pan Jamaica Group.
Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to The Rock. Um, if, it's, if it's your first time, I hope it's not your last. And if it's uh, not your first, keep coming back. To all of you in Adventureland, I'm sorry you can't be here, but uh, unfortunately this year the conference center is busy uh, tending to other business um, and hosting its, its, uh, the Seabed Authority. Um, hopefully next year we can all convene because we like to do this face to face. Anyway, thank you all for, for your participation. Um, Senator Shireen Golding Campbell, welcome. I also want to welcome Mrs. Valerie Facey, who is here with us. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and friends of the Pan Jamaica Group. We gather once again for the third installment of the annual Morris Facey Lecture Series, a platform through which we continue to advocate for the future of our city through positive action for its revitalization, in particular, the much neglected downtown. Our gathering is not merely a lecture. It is a conduit for knowledge and insight on a stage where we share proven strategies for the renewal of our nation's urban landscape. To this end, we remain committed to our purpose that beckons us to take charge of our destiny by crafting a vision and a well-structured plan that is poised to breathe new life into our cherished city and ultimately our nation. A plan at its core is a vision translated into a structured framework that guides actions. It serves as a clear and deliberate outline of steps, strategies, and objectives to achieve a specific goal and functions as a roadmap to navigate from the present to our desired future. In the realm of our own planning, a plan is much more than a mere document or a set of guidelines. It's a blueprint to guide the actions required to create a thriving urban environment, ensuring that our cities, towns, and communities function effectively while considering the future needs of its people. In the case of Jamaica and our capital city, the importance of having a defined and actionable plan cannot be overstated. With the world rapidly evolving and the effects of urbanization continuing to shape our societies, it is crucial to possess a plan for sustainable, inclusive, and resilient development. It is not only a tool for directing the formation of our physical environment, but also a means of ensuring that our nation is fully prepared to face both the challenges and opportunities of the future. This evening's Mars Facey Lecture, under its theme, The Value of a Vision, The Transformative Power of an Action on Plan, I stand before you with a profound sense of purpose as we honor Pan Jamaica's late founder and his legacy by invoking his passion for the redevelopment of our capital city and its future as a vibrant urban center. The Honorable Morris Facey, my late father, understood the transformative powers of urban development. Through Pan Jamaica, he left an indelible mark on our country by pioneering the development of commercial and residential buildings in Kingston. His commitment to nation building led him to establish several planning organizations such as the Kingston Restoration Company and Tourism Action Plan Limited, all reflecting his unwavering dedication to the betterment of our nation. He believed in the potential of Jamaica to become an ideal place to live, work, and conduct business. Pan Jamaica's vision for downtown Kingston is seeing it become a vibrant, world-class city that thoroughly, thoughtfully caters to its citizens. It's, it is one of regeneration where the heart of Kingston beats with vigor and promise as a dynamic hub of commerce and lifestyle. 
That is why we continue to stage the Mars Facey Lecture Series. This year, we are proud to host the lecture here at Rock Hotel, Pan Jamaica's newest investment in downtown Kingston. The age-old saying holds true, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Great cities around the world did not materialize by happenstance. They were carefully planned, and it is this very planning that underpins their effective functionality. Without a coherent plan, we are bound to fail, fall into a chaotic state, a subject that was expertly employed, explored in our inaugural lecture in 2019 by Dr. Pedro Ortiz, where he gave his presentation on the cost of chaos, envisaging a resilient metropolis. Last year, we had Professor Greg Clark, a globally renowned expert in cities, urban innovation and investment. He discussed the business of cities, a term he coined to highlight the pivotal role that enterprises play in shaping the future of urban environments. We are all aware that our financial resources are limited in both the private and, and public sectors. It is this scarcity of resources that underscores the vital importance of effective planning. Given these constraints, public and private sector involvement is fundamental to accelerating our city's development, and we must foster a shared vision with a plan that considers all stakeholders, including residents, the government, civil society, and business. To shed light on the value of a plan and its strategic execution under financial constraints, we have the privilege of welcoming Eleanor Sharp as our guest speaker this year. She is the director of the Department of Planning and Development in the city of Philadelphia. She holds a master's degree in city planning from the University of Pennsylvania, and her professional journey encompasses roles in architecture and city planning. Eleanor's career spans over a decade with the city of Philadelphia, and most notably in 2020, she launched the initiative Planning and Equity, a commitment to change, which is aimed at addressing historical injustices within city planning, particularly in communities of color. As a native of Kingston, her Jamaican roots, architectural background, and extensive planning expertise make her the perfect candidate to guide us through the value of a plan and its strategic implementation. Her experiences and expertise align with our purpose, emphasizing the importance of a well-structured plan that guides our action and accommodates Jamaica's future growth and prosperity. What we need is consensus and committed individuals to help execute the plans in order to ensure that our collective vision for downtown Kingston becomes a reality. The path of its transformation is within our grasp, but it necessitates the concerted effort of all stakeholders. So let us all stand together as responsible citizens and agents of change to restore and build our capital city. Together, let's welcome Mrs. Eleanor, Ms. Eleanor Sharp. Good afternoon, everyone. I have a PowerPoint, but it will come up eventually, so let me just get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very excited and nervous and also excited, but more nervous after yesterday's earthquake to be here. So thank you very much for the great welcome. It really, really brought it home to me. But all protocols observed. I would like to extend my gratitude to the Pan Jam and the CB Facey Foundation for inviting me and having me here. It's quite an honor. And it is a real great pleasure for me to talk about my daily work with the hope that there's some nuggets within what I share with you today that can move the needle forward and getting downtown Kingston humming again. So I know there's plan fatigue because people are like, we have lots of plans and there's plans, but I'm here to tell you that there are plans 
And then there are plants. And lots of plants have been created that sit on shelves, gathering dust. Nevertheless, I'm here to tell you that one can craft and create a plan that is implementable and can move the needle towards the desired, often transformative outcome. However, it is crucial, if not imperative, that a plan starts with creating a vision, a unified one, one that allows all parties involved to be vested in the outcome and who will then act to ensure that the desired outcomes are achieved by participating in the implementation of that said plan. It is also important post implementation or during implementation that there is an evaluation process layered on top of it because plans need to be living documents. They're not, they're, they reflect a moment in time, but in Philadelphia we consider them living documents because as soon as you make a plan, something else happens that impacts the plan and you always need to revisit it and update it and change it. Professor Greg Clark, who spoke here last year, a friend and a colleague of mine, presented a critical overview with global examples of successful partnerships and collaborations. But today, my approach is to get a little more in the weeds, a little bit more granular and share with you, based on my experience in Philadelphia and observation of other plans in Philadelphia, with the hopes that there's something that can be adopted or adapted for Kingston. I invite you to the journey with me as I present a couple of examples where a vision was critical and has resulted in crafting of planning documents with recommendations that have been implemented, resulting in a transformation of parts of Philadelphia. Before I begin though, officially, I want to ensure that you are aware that the credit for most of this work belongs to a large cast of characters, staff of various agencies, consultants who assisted in crafting and illustrating the visions and the plans, average citizens who engaged during all the public processes to provide feedback and guidance and leadership, and leadership from government officials who championed these efforts. It is actually my privilege to present a small snapshot of all of the extensive work that has been done. And let's figure out this, part. oh, it's there, yay. So, I structured this presentation in two parts. Part one is looking at the work that is near and dear to me. It is Philadelphia 2035. It's the comprehensive plan for the city of Philadelphia, how the vision for that was crafted, what strategies we deployed for implementation, including essential collaboration with a variety of stakeholders, and how it's been a guiding document for many with approximately 70% of its recommendations actualized. Part two, and this is very exciting for me to share the work of a sister agency who also crafted a vision and proceeded with implementation of that vision that has absolutely transformed the city's waterfront in a short space of time. And in planning lingo, that means less than 10 years, like that's short for us. I love to spread the gospel of their good work because their work is obviously, you can't miss it. I'll wrap with some key takeaways. I'd like to leave you with, so let's get started. I presented this here again to lay the foundation that a plan does not exist of itself. It is part of an entire process that one has to consider in the toolbox. And in Philadelphia, we didn't start with, a, with a writing a plan officially. We started with creating a vision. Before I highlight that, I just want to lay the context of how we even got to the point where we determined that we needed a vision. And I've met with a few people since I've been here, and there's so many similarities between places and so many challenges that we all experience. Like, it's, we, ha we all have similar problems, and it's just figuring a way of addressing them. So to lay the context, I'm gonna presume most of you know where Philadelphia is. Some of you have probably been there. It's between New York and DC. But Philadelphia is a very old city. It was laid out by William Penn in the 1600s. And it evolved and grew to that by 1854. Let me get my dates right. Um, 
to look like it does today because the surrounding districts, boroughs, and townships were consolidated in creating the Philadelphia we know today. That's the map to the far, what would be? This side, yeah. But in the 19th century, Philadelphia begins to be an industrial powerhouse. By the mid 20th century, Philadelphia is, is termed the workshop of the world. And by that time, there are two million people living in Philadelphia. The city is industrialized. Its river, rivers are very active, supporting the industrialization of the city. Simultaneously, what is happening at the government level is a legislative and regulatory processes being set up. Philadelphia organized itself by introducing an ordinance in 1929 that regarded city plan changes and public facilities. And this was further revised by, in 1942. By 1951, the city introduced its home rule charter, which is guiding principles of how the city should operate, which includes at that time the establishment of the city planning commission, which is where I work, and what the city planning commission is mandated to undertake. And one of the very first things it was mandated to undertake was a plan, a comprehensive plan for the city. So in 1960, the city's first comprehensive plan was developed, and this led to big transformative ideas, and including at that time the consolidation of railroads. Um, a lot of you play Monopoly, you know, you've heard of Reading Railroad and all those things. They all are part of in Pennsylvania. So there was a commuter tunnel built that allowed the consolidation of the railroads. We had high rises built, city center established, and the far northeast in Philadelphia was expanded with housing. And I'll come back to this later, but I want you to keep in mind also what happened was the I-95, most of you have been in America, I-95 runs from Florida to Boston, was also expanded, but it was expanded along one of our rivers, along the waterfront. So that happened in the 60s, right? However, post-World War II, and by the late 50s, early 60s, there were other significant changes afoot. Um, there was significant out-migration of not only industry, but of jobs and population. There was massive population decline. You know that comprehensive plan of 1960? The city was at 2 million people. It was growing, and they, they thought, hmm, 10 years, we'll be at 2.5 million people. Instead, what happened, the population left and we dropped to 1.5 million people. So Philadelphia became, instead of managing growth, had to start managing decline. So this also happened along our riverfronts, industry left. Although there was still some active industry, a lot of our um, pairs, as you can see, had been abandoned. Also our housing. Remember, like a city was being built out for 2.5 million people and suddenly there was less people than expected. So, and Philadelphia is an old city, so the housing stock started to deteriorate. However, some magic happened in the 2000s. Yes, the stars started to align. There was a mayor elected who cared about planning. I know, that's a thing. And he put an architect in charge of the agency who brought his own design professionals and we were encouraged to launch our first comprehensive plan. Remember the last one was in 1960, this is now the 2000s. Whenever we gave public presentation, we always liked to say when we were doing this work that the last time a comprehensive plan was done for the city of Philadelphia was before man landed on the moon. It was a long time ago. So, with that, much of the city's decision-making had evolved, because remember now the city's in decline, to one that was very transactional. There was no guiding document for decision-making to set broad city goals or to help coordinate work across departments. I don't know why I'm talking to this mic, because I actually have one here, so I'll just move over here. But after six decades of shrinking population, trends were showing that Philadelphia's population decline had stabilized and had even, even started to go upwards. Former industrial areas started to be, especially along a riverfronts and near center city, were experiencing considerable development pressure. 
So, and then local and global trends were indicating that cities were the place to be again, and that Philadelphia had an opportunity to prosper in the coming years. Therefore, there was this belief that Philadelphia was well positioned to capture its fair share or more of this prosperity with proper planning. So what happened next? We crafted this campaign that we rebranded Imagine Philadelphia. And because comprehensive planning was back in Philadelphia and this first phase was a public outreach campaign to lay the foundation for a future comprehensive plan. And this was to envision and plan for a bright future for a city for generations of people who we anticipate would live, work, learn, play, and visit Philadelphia. So the goals of laying the foundation was to collect data and background information needed for preparing a long range comprehensive plan. A second goal was to engage experts, regional experts and residents in dialogue about the future of our neighborhoods, the city and the region. And then also finally to lay out preliminary ideas about visions and goals and actions to inform the subsequent citywide comprehensive plan. And we followed the typical planning process, which a lot of you, I know there's some experts in the room, know and understand what this is. Because you start by first gathering information and planning is an iterative process. You start, you go back, you go forward, you go back to check what you did, you come back again, right? So what we did was we coalesced all the stakeholder groups, government, nonprofit, you name it. We wanted to talk to everyone. And we had stakeholder meetings, community meetings, while staff was doing research in the background with consultants because we were simultaneously engaging and doing all the legwork behind the scenes. The planning commission was at the helm of this process. And at this point for the previous 10 years before we started, there had been a lot of different entities doing plans. There were lots of plans, same thing. There were lots of plans, but we wanted to pull it together. Um, the planning commission had lots of interest. There was lots of anticipation about what could happen. And we really wanted to do that to strengthen the relationship, to move us to implementation. But how did we do this? We knew the value of leveraging everyone in this process. And so we massively engaged the public. We, we wanted to create a buzz. We wanted a city to get in on the action and to support what we were trying to do. We hired consultants to help us think through all the components that would be necessary to design and implement a comprehensive planning process. We kicked off the process in mid 2007 with a series of like round table meetings of regional experts focused on eight specific planning topics. These were followed by widely publicized workshops in late 2007 and early 2008. And these sessions provided the opportunity for broad input with the intent on generating some big ideas. We put the word out through flyers like the ones you see here and posters such as this. And I know you can't read it, but I really wanted to read it for you so that you could understand where the mindset was at the time. And the flyer says, imagine Philadelphia laying the foundation Philadelphia is roaring back with new housing, new residents, world-class architecture, and new recognition that it's America's next great city. We made it up, right? But we were going for it. People across the city have exciting visions for our future. It's time to pull it all together. The Planning Commission is beginning the process of preparing our city's first comprehensive plan in more than 40 years. Please join us at one of the January meetings to share your vision. It was as simple as that. We just got the word out to invite people to come and talk with us. As you can see, we, we documented a lot of it. We held citywide workshops and hundreds of participants, 850 big ideas. I don't know how many visions. We just collected it all and deciphered it. From that public outreach, as I mentioned, they were organized around eight specific topic breakout groups. And for each one, from all of that information, we were then able to decipher a consensus for the future of Philadelphia 
from those public workshops. In Philadelphia, what we determined for these areas, and I'll read them quickly because this lends to the idea of having a vision. Like you have to have something that seeds something that keeps it moving forward. So for arts and culture, Philadelphia is a place where arts and culture are celebrated along a vibrant parkway and avenue of the arts and also in neighborhood venues. The Philadelphia economy is diversified and the city is a global leader in green technology and niche industries. There's a wide range of housing choices that are affordable and respond to changing household needs. Neighborhoods are the lifeblood of the city, offering a complete array of services and amenities. That is true. If you've ever been to Philadelphia, Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods. Public open space and waterfronts are universally accessible. Public services and utilities are customer service oriented and service deliverable, deliverable is equitable. The region is known for intergovernmental cooperation and seamless transit system, and there's a choice of convenient interconnected modes of transportation. So we were just getting started and we really wanted to dig deeper into each of these things. And we did that. So for each of those eight things that I just shared with you, we went further. I told you we we're going to get granular today. And I'll use open space as an example. For each big idea, we further refined the vision statement. We, we plugged in three or four aspirations. We examined the rationale and any challenges we, we could see coming. We developed several big transformative ideas. We looked at... Um, best practices, and we suggested short-term actions, such we like to call it like, where's the low hanging fruit? What can we do in the meantime, right? So we did all of that for each of these areas. And that led to work later on with the staff to look at where, the, where can policy be applied here? And we came up with eight policy areas, as you see here, as public engagement was happening, commission staff and consultants were simultaneously working in tandem to bring these to the fore. And so for each of these as well, we did a similar effort. We're always peeling the onion. We're always digging deep. We crafted a vision. So for neighborhoods, imagine Philadelphia, and we went on. And then under it, we say, well, how do we make this vision a reality? We put some ideas there. Then, what are the opportunities that present here? And so always, always going back and forth, always, always trying to get to the bottom of what can we do to make this plan and these ideas actionable. Which led us to, after two years, two to three years, the conclusion of laying the foundation. Notice that we haven't written the plan yet. We've just been talking, we've just been exploring, we've just been discovering what people think and what people are interested in and what their big ideas are. And one of the big ideas was looking at a vision plan for the Delaware River. Because remember, Philadelphia's was, an in, our rivers were workhorses, they were industrial rivers, right? They had lots of industry on them. So how do we transform that? So that's one of the things that came out of it. So by the summer of 2010, we had completed laying the foundation, which was really focused on the community-based process to establish our values and set some goals. The city was also in the midst of updating or writing a new zoning code. Our code was also made before man landed on the moon, so we decided to do it at the same time. So the next step we realized was to get started on the, on the plan, on the comprehensive plan. The foundation was laid, so let's get to planning, right? But as I mentioned before, planning doesn't stand as a silo. It's not a singular thing. It, it really has to work in tandem with a lot of other things going on at the time. So the city, embarking on writing the new zoning code, decided to combine that with a new comprehensive plan. And we also, at the same time, established a planning academy an outreach arm that we call the Citizens Planning Institute to engage and educate citizens or residents. Because as you imagine, we can speak that language because we work at the commission, we know the lingo, but the average Joe, they don't know what you're talking about. What's a zoning variance? People don't always know or understand. And we thought it was 
crucial that we take the public along with us. So we established an education arm, which has been in existence 13 years now, led by a great director. And we educate average citizens, average residents, a sneak behind a curtain, planning 101, zoning 101, land use 101, like all of it. So that when we hold public meetings, that there are people in the room who are from the neighborhoods who understand what we're talking about and can share it with their neighbors. So that was very critical and crucial as part of this process. When it came to the comprehensive plan, we also looked at that in two phases. You know, vision is my favorite word. So we went back to doing a citywide vision based on all the foundation that we had laid forward. We were gonna document this in a plan with the understanding that we had garnered in the past, the former years. So our citywide vision, the first phase is what we, we, we termed it, the citywide vision looks to the 25 year mark. We did long term. If we could paint a picture of what we want Philadelphia to look like in two to three decades, what would that look like? And set forth big ideas, standards and goals as the basis for what everyone could agree with, like what's, what's in our future. Phase two dove a little deeper, we like to do that, and we focused on district planning. So the citywide vision sets out broad goals and recommendations for various topics, including housing and community development, economic development, transportation, open space, historic preservation, you name it, we try to look at it. And it is our overarching policy document for Philadelphia 2035, our comprehensive plan. It's a blueprint for how the city should grow and develop for the next 25 years. So we were trying to not make it ad hoc, but to really focus on making it happen. We, we decided that if we left Philadelphia to the trends, there was no determining where we would be or how we would get there or what we would look like. So our citywide vision establishes a policy for the city to follow so that the city can be sustainable and equitable. And these policies set the stage for more specific recommendations that are implementable at the city, district, and neighborhood levels. Our goal was to be transformative, but yet realistic in our recommendations. And the recommendations in the citywide vision are the basis for the more detailed district plans. So in Philadelphia 2035 at the citywide level, we organize into three aspirational themes, thrive, connect, and renew. And on the thrive, we grouped housing, economic development, vacancy and land management. Connect, we looked at transportation and utility systems, and renew, we looked at natural and historical res historic resources. The plan includes recommendations along with the responsible agencies to implement those recommendations. And the plan was adopted in June 2011. And once that was completed, we moved on as staff to undertaking the district plans. But as part of the citywide vision, we recognized that we had a very strong metropolitan center. We had lots of industrial legacy areas that we wanted to target for future development. And we had strong neighborhoods. So it follows the planning process all the time is, is, is how we work. Before I move on to the district plan, I really want to highlight, and I have a whole section coming up on this, but at the time, this is a Citizens Planning Academy that I mentioned, that it was launched in 2010, and the mission is to empower citizens across the city to take a more active role in shaping the future of their neighborhoods through building relationships at all levels, through advocacy, through their organizations and through direct action. So we welcome that as part of our, our work. Now skip to phase two, which is when we dove a little deeper to look at each district. In order to delve down into specific strategies and to make sure all reaches of the city got equal attention, we divided the city into 18 geographic districts and created individual district plans for each. We got specific community input from district residents, we built consensus, we made sure that city policy objectives are met at the local level. And we built a list of priorities for city work and funding and we determined like zoning remapping needs. So each district plan also followed the theme Thrive, Connect, Renew and recommendations also followed along the, those lines. Which led to our next section, how do we implement this thing? So, 
As part of our implementation across the 18 districts plans, I'm here to tell you that there are 3,000 and something recommendations. That's a lot of recommendations, even for a planner, right? But we use a database to track. We put, we put um, each recommendation in and we can sort according to, we can generate reports based on the progress of the recommendations, which planning district it is, which city council district, and who are the implementing agencies. Because we felt it important to be able to report back and to show. So when you engage with people and you meet with people and you tell them this is what you're going to do, we have the responsibility to also always communicate to them that we, we heard you and we're following up on what we heard from you. One of the, the other pieces that we used to track our progress was in each district, there were proposals for recommendations for zoning. I don't, somebody told me it's called something different here in Jamaica, maybe, I don't know. But the city's zoning hadn't also been updated. So you had a lot of areas in the city where people needed to go get a variance. They had a two-story row house and they needed to go get a variance because it was zoned something else. So we undertook a complete rezoning, remapping of the city. And this included corrective rezoning is what we called it, like level setting, making sure that the land use matches what it's zoned at. We also did um, zoning for, now I'm blanking on what we called it, but to advance the plan. Like, do we want to upzone certain parts of the city that can accommodate development? And that's what we did. So we also tracked that. We, we tracked our remapping status. We worked very closely with electeds to make this happen. We also worked very closely with the implementing agencies and we worked with them according to our themes. So we would gather the commerce department, the housing people, the industrial people, the public housing folks to talk about the recommendations and we would convene meetings with them and say, hey, these are the recommendations that you were a part of creating. Where are we on making sure that they're happening? So I'm proud to say that of those 3000 recommendations, we have definitely advanced at different stages, approximately 70% of them. We try, we try. Oh, to the staff. <laughs> and I just wanted to share with you, it's hard to tell here because, and all of this guys that I'm talking about, we have a great website, Phil 35, you can always reference it and get more details on, on all of this. But I just pulled a few examples of how, how we did this. So. Broaden area is a major intersection in the city of Philadelphia and to, to implement the recommendations that we were made there, there was a task force formed between interagency and the community to improve pedestrians and safety and traffic calming and flow and to enhance the public spaces because it wasn't looking like bright and shiny like we knew it could be. And right there is located one of our major transit stations and we wanted to improve the business corridor and renovate a, like a public library there. So this task force led by the planning commission along with the office of transportation and the commerce department worked with community people to make a lot of these things become a reality. The commerce department in partnership with a local NGO are working with businesses and property owners to revive the commercial corridor. The planning commission received a grant to activate the public space and we had a whole day of workshop with the community to paint and plant, et cetera, et cetera. And um, our trans transportation department is working to improve the intersection, which will start later in the year. So that's kind of how we do it. We like literally tease it out and who needs to be at the table and who can we work with to move the needle forward on a lot of these recommendations. Another one is Franklin Square. Franklin Square was a focus area in one of our plans and some of the recommendations including narrowing the, the square is across like a major road that was not easily accessible. So one of the recommendations was to narrow it for better pedestrian connections to the square, redevelop a parking lot, redevelop a parcel where our former police headquarters sat and reopen, there's a New Jersey, a Patco station, a tra uh, train station there. And how, how can we do this? So we, part we worked, we contacted the people who we're in charge of the train to fund, to, we tried to find a developer for one of the parking lots and the city worked to, um, with the community to visualize and brainstorm what could be done with the parcel of the former police station. So we're always trying to like convene and make connections. And last but not least, 
Wissahickon train station, you can see from the map, from our plan, we called for the establishment of a transportation center here because a lot of buses come through and it's very busy intersection. But this is along one of our, our second river, the Schuylkill River. We also wanted a river trail to go by here and there needed to be road improvements and then there's development parcels. So can we have some mixed use development here and public space? So we worked with SEPTA, which is the, the Southeast Pennsylvania Transit Authority and other partners for land acquisition to make this become a reality. And I think, I'm not sure where it is in the process, but it's, it's a consistent thing that's being worked on. So as I mentioned, I said I would talk a little bit about engagement and outreach because we think it's very, very critical that this, we wouldn't have been as successful as we are. And I just want to caveat that we had a lot of challenges. We had a lot of lessons learned. It wasn't perfect. We, we were figuring stuff out as we were going, because remember, it's the first time this is being done in a number of years. But one of the most critical things we recognize is that we needed to engage the public, and we did it in multiple and sundry ways, including creating steering committees, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with folks, having public meetings. We did it all. But how did we get the word out? Any way possible, by any means necessary, this is how we did it. Flyers, posters, print media, local organizations, we just spread the word a lot. And then at the time, online platforms were becoming very big. And so we figured out what tools can we use to spread the word even further. And we did just that. So we had a lot of public participation, which was crucial to the plan being received by the time it was done. And we engage with a lot of people. We don't leave anyone out. We want everybody to be part and parcel of the vision and the plan that we're doing, especially for implementation. And just a little update. So we finished our district, final district plan, 18th district plan in 2018, and we immediately started to take a look back to analyze, well, where did we have success? Where can we learn some things? Where did we have failures? To set ourselves up and not wait another 50 years to update the plan again. And so our staff now is working on it behind the scenes. We haven't launched it officially yet. And this is what the public has said to us. As you know, in 2020, George Floyd was murdered, and that totally changed the dynamics of um, planning and equity, as Stephen mentioned, like I even put out a call to planning directors across the nation to focus on equity and look at planning and the harm it had wrought and how can we redress that. So the, the, the public really resonated with that. And so they want us not to be so siloed in how we look at planning and it's not just a physical thing, but social issues are also important making sure that underrepresented communities are heard and that we, we engage even better than we did before. And so we're looking forward to partnering with old and new partners as we move forward. And the American Planning Association put out um, the circle that you see there are all the topics that they would like to be included once you're doing a comprehensive plan. But for us in Philadelphia, at the heart of that is equity. We really want to interlace that and make sure that we move forward so that we can create our Philadelphia, our next plan to plan together. Okay, that was part A. Part B, which makes me really excited because it's so tangible and so easy to see how, how this came together. So similarly, um, crafting a master plan for the Delaware River was formed. Lots of public engagement to craft a vision, a follow-up plan to define an action for the next 10 years, and a master plan that has and continues to be successfully implemented, resulting in the absolute transformation of the city's waterfront. So, a civic vision for the Central Delaware and an action plan for the Central Delaware are two documents, also online, I, I believe, completed by Penn Praxis in 2007 and 2008, respectively. And they are the culmination of a highly successful citizen engagement process, which created a shared vision for the Central Delaware waterfront. The master plan for the Central Delaware utilizes the core principles set forth in the civic vision to establish a detailed framework for redevelopment along the waterfront. What you see is the portion of the Central Delaware that they focused on. You're not seeing it. It's, I'm seeing it. Oh. 
right? But you can, I can see it. Oh, here, no, you still can't see it. Uh, this was the fun part. There we go. Okay. So they created a number of plans, but they really started like thousands of people came forward to share in the vision, and then they created an action plan, and then they created a master plan. So these are documents that documented the whole process. But the, is it showing? Okay. The study area was this portion of the Delaware, which is directly proportional to the heart of our center city. And so I just want to share with you some examples. So one of their strategies, did I write this down? No, I'll just talk from the hip. One of their strategies was to really focus on establishing a connected trail network through multi-use trails, et cetera, et cetera. And successfully, they have done this. So what you see is portions of the trail that have been built and constructed since they came up with this idea. Another strategy they said was our waterfront. Remember I told you I-95 sort of separated our city, but there were connected streets that had led to the water at some point. How can we strengthen? Because it's under 95. It's just like a really psychological barrier. But how can we reinforce those connections again? And so they identified all the connected streets and currently work to make them wonderful connections. So on the, my left, you see... The exi what it used to be before and how they've tried to transform the street. Is it showing? Yeah. Try to transform the streets. They also did the same thing, and this was the most impressive part of it. Their strategy here was along the stretch of the river, every half a mile, there's going to be a park. There's going to be something that gathers people. They're going to program it. S stuff's going to happen. And when I say day, that's the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, which was created specifically to look at the waterfront. And one of the first parks they did was Spruce Street Harbor Park. They anticipated 250,000 people would show up the first year. And I could be lying, but they got about a million. I'm like, the ratio of what they expected, numbers could be off, but what they expected versus what they got was like way more. And it continues to be highly successful. Similarly, the piers that were abandoned for years and there transformed into places that people go, people do yoga there, they take their dog, you can go read a book. So the, along the river, there's all this work happening based on a vision that people shared that led to a plan that led to this corporation that's now implementing it. Cherry Street Pier, another abandoned pier, highly successful. I think they have an artist in residence program. They have events there. There's lots that goes on now along the river. Now it's a destination that people go to. And the dream of all dreams is to connect the city back to the river. And this is a vision. This is an idea, but it's going to be a reality because all the partners that be the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, the city, and I believe some foundation is also involved in funding to ensure, I don't know if you can see, does this have a pointer? Yeah, yeah. so here is the 95. Here is the city. Here is the river. How do we make this connection? The idea is to build a park. Build a park. And it will break ground in 2026. It's going to happen. So eventually when you come to Philadelphia, you will see that park. And this is it looking back from, here's 95 again. But you see the power of a visual, right? It's creating a vision and getting people to buy into that vision to say, this can happen. We can dream this and it can happen. And that's, so a few points. I don't even know how long I took, a few points. I believe that nothing happens without intention. I heard the planning director in Toronto speak one time and she made it very clear that Toronto is also going through a crazy boom and has been, but you had to be intentional to make sure the Toronto, that the people who lived in Toronto wanted, happened. You, nothing happens by, by happenstance. You have to be intentional and direct to drive it. Stakeholder engagement is paramount. Collaboration is a must. We all must work together. You got to be flexible and nimble because things are going to come up that you can't foresee and you got to be able to pivot. 
Preservation of community identity and heritage, we learned, is paramount. People want to be respected. People love their neighborhood. They just want it nicer and greener and all of that. So we were very respectful of that. And last but not least, an understanding of the regulatory and political landscape. Very important to make these things happen. I think that's, that's what I got. Thank you. I think we have questions now. I finished early? Did I, fi I finished late, I'm sorry. Very good, it was very good. Hello. Please, you can Shall we sit? sit there. Yes, certainly. And that caught me a little bit by, caught me a little off guard. Because I was so enthralled with the presentation, I wasn't paying attention to what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> you weren't looking at the questions. I was, I was not looking at the questions. So I was looking at um, a very good presentation. Wouldn't you agree? Would you? Thanks, guys. And, and the beauty of it is that this is somebody who's been along for the entire ride, right? Um, I'm amazed that you're talking about the period between 2007 and 2022. It's not even 20 years yet. 20, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have these conversations regularly, right? Um, with all the people who love downtown, who want to see the city um, thrive from that kernel into the wide out. Kingston, we talk, about, we talk about plans that are 50 years old and what happened in 1976. You know, this, this demonstrates that you can get something done in less than a generation. And I think that that's just brilliant. That's, that, that's, that's fantastic. So, okay, on to the best part of it, the Q&A. The Q&A, Eleanor, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we have a load of questions. Um, and I'm just going to go at them. Oh, goodness. From the point of view of... Um, so, the first one I wanted to ask you... How were all of these implementations funded? Basic question, right? I feel weird sitting, so I'm just going to stand. Yeah, sure. Um, you... so, so, some of it, like, we played cheat, right? So, when we, we met with some of the agencies, like, if they already had it on the books, we sort of collaborated with them to say, hey, let's include this because they already had funding with it. Some of it, we look for funding through just like you guys look for funding we look for grants we look for anybody and some of it we some of it doesn't all need funding some of it just needs people to roll up their sleeves and get together and figure mm -hmm. out how we're going to make it happen right. some of it is volunteers some of it is community organizations so you name it we tried it but but there was a there was a public budget for there was a much budget of this. for <clears throat> doing the plan that we got funded for to do the plan from a philanthropic organization. Wow. But, but that was the, we didn't get funding for implementation. We got funding to do the plan. Okay. And then fundraising after and, and development still, and so on. Still, so still. It, it had to do a lot with the mindset of all the folks who were obviously yes. involved, eh? Yeah. Yeah. This, this leads to another set of questions because apart from the, everybody's wondering about the money, mm -hmm. they're also wondering about the players, right? Yes. So at, at the inflection point, you know, who was involved? Because you, you spoke about the mayor, you spoke about the planning office. But, but I, I know from experience that these things don't happen in just one particular point. Were there other stakeholder groups um, playing a major role to move it forward? Who were they? What, what, what happened I think there? it depends on what the recommendation was. So we would convene the relevant movers and shakers for each, each topic. So we never worked in a silo. We always worked with and, and collaborated with and convened everyone that we thought was relevant to that recommendation. Oh. Sometimes they didn't show up, but that's okay. We still invited You just them. kept going. You yeah. just kept going. Yeah. So, so the business community, the churches, the, the, you, you had to bring them to the table. Um, there was, a, was there a political movement? So, so here, I'm, I'm thinking about here, and, and the question begs this, is that there are a number of stakeholders who have yeah. this interest. Yeah. And from time to time, they go off and they talk to themselves. Mm -hmm. Or they try to get a, a cohesive group together. But it, it, it doesn't really have the effect of moving the ball forward with the political directorate, with the business community, and so on. So I just wonder about that, and I see that 
string up in a number of questions. Somebody actually said, consultation is token at best. <laughs> well, you we know, were so. very careful about that because it has been in the past. Remember I told you about the history of planning. Like we, we are very deliberate about not engaging to check a box. And we're very cognizant about not making promises, about engaging authentically with letting people know like, yes, that is the history, but we legitimately want to hear what your point of view is. And if you're not honest like that, people will know, people will see. Right. So we have eight, 18 districts. We have a planning staff person assigned to a district and they build relationships in their district with the people who live and work in that district so that when we go to work there, we're not just showing up on like Christmas day, hey, but there's a constant monitoring and fostering of a relationship because we're in the business of relationships. That's, that's how we get our work done. Thank you. Would, would you say that um, political change, so change of administration, change in the mayor's office, how did that impact what happened over the, 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 the two decades? I. I think it was on such a, um, was such a, on a good track already that I don't know if it would have been politically expedient to sort of take it off track. So although the administration changed, our current mayor supported us and allowed us to keep going and finish in 2018. Okay. But so it's, I just want to say though, for Philadelphia, it is, it is a, it's, it is a mandate. It is a charter mandated thing. It is part of our requirements to do. The fact that we didn't do it for so many decades is another story, <laughs> but we are supposed to do it. So we have that behind us that allows us to say to people, we're supposed to do this and maintain it and always update it. And so this is what we do. So there was a charter, there was an actual There's citizen's charter. charter that no, no, the city charter, home the rule city charter, charter itself from 1951 okay. says the planning commission is responsible for the physical plan of the city. Okay. Uh, someone asked, is, Philly is quite ethnically diverse. Do all ethnicities have a stake? And is that virtually evident in the urban fabric? And I guess you could expand that to all classes. Uh, you know, do poor people actually have equal participation with yes. the wealthy and so on? So, but in terms I'll of say the this, though. The, of course, people of privilege will have more time on their hands to show up to a <laughs> public meeting. So... But we're really? conscious of that, and so we look for other ways to engage, which is why one of, the, one of the factors that I said in our next plan, that we're still focusing on engagement because we can do it better, because there are populations sure. that we don't always reach sure. through language, to whatever it is, and we're like, but we are real. We want everybody's participation. So the, the, onus, the work is on us to figure out how to reach those populations and engage with them in ways that they feel comfortable mm -hmm. engaging so that we can incorporate their wants, needs, and desires in the overall vision. So, so you, get, you get complaints, I'm sure, and pushback. Oh, oh. And I'm, all of them, right? <laughs> but that doesn't daunt you, that you just keep no, working in the process. because you're a professional and you mm. get to understand that people are living their lives. And... Government is not, especially in America right now, it's, it's people don't like government, right? So I'm coming along, oh, oh, here is something I wanted. It's so esoteric from their daily needs. Like people are struggling. So I'm coming in, I want to do a plan and create a vision. There's a disconnect there, which is again, one of the reasons why we're looking at social issues as well in the next iteration, it, because we want to meet people where they are. And we want to say to them, we understand where your needs are, but we want you to also not be left behind as part of this process. So it's a sell job. It's a bit of a sell job because it here, be. I mean, I here, call we, it that, well, no, but, but, but here we have a lot of, of, let's say jadedness. Is that a word? Jadedness oh, it's, it's because of the though. process. And, and so to overcome that, yeah. I am very interested. Oh, in, okay. in, in how you do that. So that, that's talk a, lot. a conversation for another time. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, we, you know, we build relationships. That's what we do before we need anything or want anything. Right. We meet people. We go talk to Mrs. Brown. How you do? Like we, we build relationships. That's, door, that's, that's door what we to do. Door, door to door. That's good. Um, here's one that's a little technical. What strategies were used to assemble land for specific redevelopment purposes in the right locations? Was land pooling or land readjustment used? Because obviously you would have, you know, elements that you wanted to, to overdevelop or develop so, over. I'll say this. We are not implementers. We are right. just conveners. Okay. So when it comes to land assembly, we leave stuff to the market. We leave stuff to our redevelopment agencies. So mm. 
we actually don't assemble get down into that, that, that so so what are the kind of you know looking at the vertical integration of getting it actually done what do you have downstream from you you've got redevelopment agencies oh part partners not right. not they're not downstream they're side okay yeah. so there is we have a land bank we have because remember that half a million people who left Philadelphia. So all of a sudden there was such vacancy, like 10,000 parcels vacant, houses abandoned, deteriorated. So we have an established land bank, we have a redevelopment agency, we have a housing development corporation. Like, so there's lots of agencies that, oh, I said this earlier. Sometimes it's important that when it comes to an issue that you have a dedicated staff or group of people who when they go to sleep, that's what they dream about. When they wake up, that's what they think about. Like it is critically important. If people are doing this on the side or <laughs> by the by, it's, it does not have the same impact, right? So the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, for example, that was created 13 years ago. And those people, like that's their bread and butter. That's what they do. It's part of the city. I consider it part of our overall comprehensive plan because it's improving the city, but that's what they do. We work with them. It's great, right. but that's, that's what they do. They live it. So just like any other topic, our housing agency, they live and breathe it. We tend to do a lot of convening and making sure the ball keeps rolling and that we, because when people get caught up in their day-to-day -day transactional, it's hard to think, it's hard to think outside of it because you're just so busy doing what you need to do. Right. So we come along and be the glue. Sure. Sure. So we have a lot of ad hoc groups here. Okay. We're trying to move the ball forward and, and more power to them. But what you're saying is that you really do need specialists who live this and are accountable for this. Read this, yes. Right? Um, so that, that's important. I mean, I mean, somebody actually asked about exactly, exactly that. Um, you know, who fund, again, who funded oh those Lord, downtown agencies? Right. So, so I think the recognition here is that there is a, is a wide gap between, say, Philadelphia and Kingston. So, may so, not be that wide. So, but. so I'm going to settle this because, because it's America, you think, oh, we have so much money. Philadelphia is the poorest, one of the poorest cities in, in, in America, period. We, we don't have money. I, my staff is so small. And it sounds funny because it's American. And you're like, but you always have money. We don't have money. Our budget <laughs> is so small. We do things based on, like, collaboration and pulling together there's um one we got funded in 07 for for imagine philadelphia and we've gotten funding from there's um a municipal like there's like nine counties around philadelphia including philadelphia there's a delaware county regional planning association and they often give out grants and we tap them every now and then to just give us a grant so we can keep the needle moving because the city's budget philadelphia has a lot of issues and Planning, I wouldn't say, is like at the top of being funded 100% because there's some serious social issues that we're dealing with, right? There's a drug crisis. There's, there's lots of things to deal with. So it's really, really hard to put your hand up and get all the funding that you need. So we struggle similarly. That's all I want to say. Yeah. I am not. We are not rich. <laughs> it's all relative, right? It's well, all yeah. Relative. I mean, look, the, the, the point, I guess the point is that if it's up, it depends on your idea of priority. Right, because because you're you know you're poor, you're a poor city relatively, but but you found you you had the allocated budget, well, and, we, no, and you we then it. went out and sourced funding as well from the private sector and, and philanthropic organizations and so on. We didn't have an allocated budget, is what I'm trying At to all. say. Ooh. We did not. Zero. Yes. Sounds familiar. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Sounds familiar. Okay, so we have to talk more about exactly how yes. you get blood from stone, yes. which it is one of those possible. things that we have found. We have quite the hobby of doing that here. Um, again, more funding. <laughs> Did the national government have a strong impact or influence in redesigning the city? Were they involved at all? No, no it, was just, it was just a city-based um, movement Philadelphia and, city and the, the elements class, that were there. We do our thing, yeah. Right. Because we talk about all our urban centers, but, but I mean, obviously there is a kinship for particular urban centers with the people that live there and, and that's where the impetus so philadelphia is one of those from. unique cities that's also a, a city and a county like same bo same borders where there's other municipalities where like they're part of a county so then the mm -hmm. county planning agency 
would be part of that. We don't have we have one planning agency. What does the governance structure for the the citizens planning institute look like? How does that actually governance structure? Yeah, how does it how does it work? I oh, mean, how okay. does it? Yeah. So we offer two cohorts a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. We accept about 30, 30 candidates. Normally we have around two hundred and something people applying, which tells us that there is this great demand always for people to understand what's going on in the city and how it works. And we run them through a six week, seven week process program of educating them about our lingo. Okay. And With a staff of one for like the first 10 years, then we <laughs> added two and then now I think we're wow. three. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like it's not, it's, it, it's the, well, you know. the, the art of the possible. Yeah. Clearly. Somebody said, how does, Initiatives like IRA and Justice 40 help to drive the equity principles. I mean, I guess that's something that you're familiar with. No, <laughs> I don't know what that is either. But maybe they can, I maybe they like can I clarify. Know, but I don't know. I don't know what that is, right? Right. Um, how do the, how have the concerns for climate change impacted city planning in your context? So in the yeah. Latest? So again, mm -hmm. climate change very important to our next iteration of our comprehensive plan but we have an office of sustainability where those people wake up every day and that's what they think about. So we will work with them. I think they're in the process now of doing a climate adapt adaptation plan or something. So we, we, work, we would partner with them on making that a reality so that we would absorb it within our comprehensive plan. But it's critical, it's a hot topic. Great. Okay, and lastly, I'm gonna ask you to reiterate, I think you, I saw it already, but somebody has asked, what are the keys to ongoing stakeholder engagement? What do, you, what do you mean? So, so how do you keep people engaged in the process? Oh. I, don't, I don't think... It's not about keeping them engaged in the process. It's about having relationships with people so that when a process comes up, you have these relationships that you can say, we're going to launch this. Can you support us? Can you come out? Can you get your community to come out? So. That's what we do, and that's we, we literally staff ourselves accordingly so we can maintain and sustain relationships, and we're not waiting for something to happen to then go and talk to people. Like, we're consistently building relationships. Okay, great. You passed. <laughs> Please, you can sit, sit, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, you can um, feel free. We're not asking you any more questions, Thank so it's you. fine. But, but, I, but I did, I, you know, what resonated with me was this idea of, of having um, an entity that's engaged 24-7. Yeah. You know, that's all they do, and it's about the city, right? Yeah. It's not the mayor's office. No. The mayor has a lot of other things to do, but there is somebody who's thinking about redevelopment because redevelopment is, you, you, you get a brand new city, urban redevelopment starts right there. Mm -hmm. And so we've been around since the 1700s, 1600s, 1658, 16, 16 uh, anyway, off, yeah. right, so the 1600s, and so urban renewal has, has been, you know, in fits and starts, but obviously, at it's this doable, point, guys. we need it's, something that, that uh, keeps going, so I want to thank you again, um, it's you my know, pleasure. The, the, the massive engagement of the public also resonated with me as well, that was an important point that I thought you, you made, um, and, and the fact that you were thinking about open spaces all the time, open spaces, um, and all the elements that go into downtown. I, mean, I, I love the, the overpass, the trains. right? The, the overpass the of Harbor Street and Port Royal Street. Mm -hmm. We could really use that right about now because uh, okay. those are, those are yeah. two main thoroughfares where the trucks run through just above we, the water. You know, what I didn't emphasize enough, we don't make this, these things up on our own. We, we research, we visit, we talk to all the cities, we get ideas, we share them back and forth, we batter them. So, like, this is, you're giving me applause, but this applause goes to a whole lot of people who have done a whole lot of, of work to sort of, of get us to this point, that even in Philadelphia, we're barring from here and there and, and all kinds of things. Excellent. You can do the same thing. It's fine. Right. It's provable. It's doable. Yeah. It's been done. Yeah. No need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's it for Eleanor. I believe that's our time. Eleanor will be joining us for refreshments, so you can bend her ear a little more. Please ask her your additional questions. If I missed any, I apologize. I was sort of trying to group them because there were, there were so many. But I think we got to most of them. And so it just leaves me to thank the folks 
who were involved in putting this together. An event of this magnitude? We are not being available today. Oh. Because we are looking at the performance of the Yeah. 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 Y
见。